Hi, today we're going to be looking at how to create a strong sense of light and using color with the intensity and temperatures creating those effects. So we're working with an image, a subject of a back road in broad sunlight in the wintertime. It's just going to give us lots of opportunities to explore that temperature and intensity contrast. Here I'm jumping in now to flush in the no tan. So I have loaded my brush with the purpley green color um, and am blocking in the darkest darks on this canvas. I'm painting on a linen panel, one of the Raymar linen panels. And notice that I have not tinted the um, painting this time. So I wanted to show you something a little different. So I have not toned the ground. I'm working straight onto the white of the linen. And you might have seen those little marks on the, the canvas to begin with on the panel. That was just to mark where the center of the panel was so that I could visualize where I needed to outline the shapes. So right now I am just using the brush and the paint to flush out almost like drawing off the thumbnail um, or drawing those basic shapes for the no tan. Now some of those lines look light. The only reason they look light is because the brush is skipping across the surface of the linen. I have not used any medium with that paint whatsoever. So resist the temptation. You should not be using medium with the first layer of paint anyway. That's structurally an unsound practice. So resist that temptation. If you're working with acrylics, you can thin the paint down a little bit, but I use that initial lay-in with the brush, straight with the paint, nothing else, totally unadulterated. So just trying to get the basic framework on there. And once I have done that and adjusted, don't worry about wiping off or erasing. You can just adjust. More paint will come on there and cover up any mistakes that you make. Going on and blocking in where the darkest darks are, where the no tan is for that particular composition. It's kind of a feeling around process. So you're feeling for where those darks are, feeling for where the forms are. Just as with using the knife, that no tan is pretty thin. So I am not loading that canvas with tons of thick paint. If you put it on too thickly, then it is all going to blend together as you put on the next layers. That is one of the, the things that's hard to kind of get a grasp on with direct painting, with painting a la prima to begin with. But it really doesn't matter which tool you're using to apply the paint. The process is pretty much the same way. Um, you block in thinly and don't apply the paint super thick. So you gradually thicken, put more paint on as you go. I strongly recommend if you're using the brush, just like with the knife, to let the gesture of the mark show through because it adds a certain vitality to the painting that you're not going to get any other way. So you can see I'm gradually working out the shape. Think of it as sculpting. Um, I think that's one of the better analogies that I've ever found for painting, that you really are shaping space with the knife or the brush. You are not drawing. You're shaping things. And it doesn't matter whether it's an abstract painting or a representational one. In either case, you are shaping form. You're shaping space. So now that I've got that right hand side established, I'm going on and blocking in the left hand side. Now some of you might look at that photograph and think, but the trees have so much light value on them. And they do. Indeed they do. But behind that, there are some strong darks. So I need to go on and figure out where they're going to be just so I know where I need to apply paint later.
So most of the darks in this painting are weighted towards the top and the right. In that far distance and in the shadows on the right hand side of the road. Once you have that main no tan blocked in and you can see the basic pattern there, I'm gonna get just a little bit more on there. Um, then you can start jumping in with the other colors, but don't be tempted to get everything else out before you've established those basic shapes. Think about making the marks indicate the way things grow, the way directions that shapes tilt or turn, so that the angle of the mark is as important as the mark itself. So one of the things I was interested in capturing there was the sort of sweeping growth patterns that pine trees have. They work in units. So I don't want to paint pine straw. I want to paint the shape of the pine limb. Those mid-range limbs tilt upwards and then the limb will gradually tilt down as it moves out. So knowing something about the structure of what you're painting really will help, help you capture the essence of what it is that you're looking at. Observation is not just about observing and making a mark. It's about observing a long time before you ever get to making the mark. And if you haven't tried one of these Raymar panels yet, I would highly recommend them. These are the ultralights, so they're super thin. If you're a plein air painter, they work very, very well for going outside and not having to haul around heavy stuff. They are just as easy as gesso boards to attach to a piece of foam core, which is what I've done here. Simply using those loops of scotch tape on the background. I mean, the back of the panel makes it fairly easy to um, put the panel up there so that you can reach all the way to the edges. Now, the second step after doing that block in of the no tan, I go from the darkest dark to the, the lighter area, which is this, generally the sky. Now, literally, it's not that much lighter in some cases than a lot of the areas of the tree but it's a very different section. It's a big mass. So I'm working with that sky color. Remember, we're working with the ultramarine blue and white at the top. That's where it's going to be the darkest and more purpley, more reddish vi uh, violet. There's a little bit of that in there. Uh, it's not absolutely pure blue. Working by moving the brush around a number of different directions, means that I can block that in fairly quickly and notice that's not an itty bitty little brush it's a filbert and I believe that one was a number eight it may have been a number six but it's still a fairly a larger brush um, relatively speaking now I've gone to the middle value blue and working that in in a really loose way so I'm not over blending it Look at the kind of shapes that develop as you're painting, and if they become interesting, let them stay. Don't feel like you have to be tied literally to the photograph. So I'm gradually taking it down from the darkest, more ultramarine blue, to the mixture of phthalo and ultramarine. And then the blue that will be right at the top of the trees in the far background will be that very light mixture that was mainly phthalo blue and white, but with a tiny little bit of yellow in it as well. So 
So the advantage of working with that big brush is that you're covering that territory very quickly. So that you're getting color onto the panel and onto the canvas fairly fast. And one thing I didn't tell y'all was that the size of this one is roughly a 9 by 12. And I'm painting on it vertically. That's a little larger than the studies that we've been doing. So I wanted to also mix that up a little bit. That lightest blue is right there at the bottom, right above the tree line. Notice that I'm not trying to paint the sky holes yet in those trees on the left. Sky holes, those pockets or open spaces between limbs and masses of foliage, really should be left to almost the last thing. If you put them in too early, then you're spending the rest of the painting session trying to paint around these very small areas. So once I have the sky blocked in, I'm going to block in that road, which is the other very large mass in the painting. You can tweak and adjust as you go. So to adjust that edge where the far distant trees are meeting the sky, I can go back and tweak that just a little bit. So you can always go back and adjust those shapes as you need to while you're working. Grabbing some more of the purple and giving a little bit more detail to the dark area of the trees. Again, still not the time to jump into fine detail. Don't get that number two brush out. Hide it away. I'll see you into your studio if you get it out. But flush out the basic shape. So remember you're going from general to specific, from the larger shapes to the smaller shapes. Now we have a little bit of the middle value green that is beginning to go into the darker areas behind the tree. So it is a step a little bit lighter than the violet that was the no tan. And it will not show as distinctly as it looks like right now in the block-in stage. It's just a little bit lighter than the purple. But what that does is begin to put some color underneath that I can put lighter colors on top of. And it solidifies that pattern of darks a little bit more. One of the things that is so distinctive to me about that photograph and about that road, it's a road I know really well, is the color of the clay in the bank. Um, that is a, a, an edge that has been scraped and scraped uh, for decades. It's a, an old road. And in places, it dips down and you can see this sharp bank of clay that leads into the edge of the woods. That clay, when it's hit by the sun at just the right time of day, turns into almost a molten coral color. So putting very intense coral pink 
on that edge makes it look like the sun is hitting it. But you have to exaggerate those differences a little bit, just like we were talking earlier in earlier modules about exaggerating the value contrast. You want to exaggerate the contrast in intensity uh, here in order for it to exact create the strongest sense of light as that afternoon light floods those trees and that bank. The right hand side of the road is in shadow because the light is coming from roughly that direction. Now I'm going in between those fingers of that coral pink with that middle value to lighter value pink that I had mixed. So I'm beginning to work back and forth between the dark and the light there, beginning to shape that space some. Again, think about the direction of the marks. That section has very strong linear patterns on it that are based on the shadow patterns that are thrown across the road. Remember the sun is on the right hand side and the tall grasses on that right hand side block the sunlight. There are a host of very small, um, small in comparison, small pine trees and a few stragglers on that right hand side that make those thin shadows on the roadbed. So you want to make the marks of the brush go in the direction of those shadows. So here you see that lighter lavender color that I mixed up. That is the shadow color for the road. It's also going to play a role in the trunks of the trees. So I'm working on the big to the next to the big on down to details. So notice I didn't jump right into little itty bitty details. I'm dealing with this sort of middle range breaking up of that, those shapes and those spaces. And again, I'm not using any medium. This is paint straight out of the tube. Now for those grasses on the right hand side, I am blocking it in with the neutral, the same sh color that's the shadow in the road. It's that neutral light violet color, lavender color that I was calling it. And one of the reasons I'm using that is it is a kind of a medium value in comparison and intensity in comparison to the pink. So to create the illusion that the light is hitting that bank of, of grasses on the right hand side um, really strongly, I'm going to use a more neutral color against a very, very intense color. So playing off neutrals against intensities can create the same sense of shape, space, and light as playing off value contrasts. That same neutral violet is now becoming the underlying color for the tree trunks, the trunks of the pines over on the left hand side. Because uh, going on top of that neutral value with a very intense neutral value, neutral color with a very intense color is going to create that same strong contrast that I was talking about. Now you have the trunks of those foreground trees on the left hand side established and I'm going to bring out the trunks of those distant trees on the right hand side. So remember work from background to foreground as well as large shapes to small shapes. So that background is established and I'm beginning to build up the middle and the foreground. laying in now some of the darker to medium values of the roadbed. 
And again, playing off of temperature and intensity with the shadow color being the cooler color and the medium range color being the warmer color. And here you can see where I'm adding some more of that middle range lavender to the shadow on the edge of the roadbed over on that right hand side. There is a long sort of thin middle range shadow on that side that you might not notice at first, but it parallels the darkest dark. And then it shoots out in these little thin fingers across the roadbed. In some ways, I think to me that's the most interesting part of that scene. I get fascinated by the shadows and the shadow patterns. Now, when you look at something that's that complex, you don't have to treat it literally. So that doesn't mean that you have to sit there and count how many fingers go across the roadbed. What's important is for you to think about what those shadows mean. They are the shadows of the trees on the right hand side that you can't see. So they give the viewer some information about what the rest of that landscape and that landscape experience is without having to spell it out literally. So thinking about how you're treating them helps to sort of set the stage even more for the viewer on what it is that they're looking at. Now in the background, in the farthest distance, you have a line, a massive line of trees. That's a tree farm. Actually it's a tree farm on the right and uh, in the background. They are these large stands mainly of pine trees. Logging is a big industry here in South Carolina and in that particular part of the county. Those trees uh, grow really quickly and when they're planted, they're planted all in rows and they have this sort of dense mass to them. But one of the things that's distinctive about pine trees is that when they're hit by sunlight, they go super, super warm. So to block in that sort of dense, thick mass of distant pines, those are baby pines, um, I need to have a warm green. So that's that light green that I mixed up. It's not super light, but maybe more the medium one that was on the bottom right hand side. And I am blocking it into the distance to show where the light is falling on those dark green trees. Now the shadows in that kind of a, an area are going to remain purple, more purpley. Remember, this is winter time, and that particular, it's actually late fall, early winter. The underlying tone in this particular landscape is that sort of purpley color. Taking that same green and blocking it in behind the pine stand on the left-hand side. Those pine trees on the left have grown naturally. They weren't planted. So they're not in rows, so they form this sort of independent mass of pine trees. And like so many trees, they lean in towards each other, almost like they were born at the same time, probably were. So that green goes on between the trunks of the trees and becomes the background. Also blending in some of the lighter green that I mixed up. That was the cinnabar green light and yellow ochre. There are lots of small trees behind those bigger trees. And you don't want to try to draw them. You just indicate them. Now I'm going into those 
shapes that I've just broken up with the green and I'm adding that hot pink to it because remember as I said the pine needles look pink as they're hit by light so it's not going to stay just like green it needs to have that warmer and lighter value put on lighter color put on top Going to the right hand side and fleshing out some of the mass of pine needles on that distant tree. And pine limbs grow kind of in a sort of diagonal line when you look at the masses. So look at the photograph on the right at that little tree and then look at the way I just painted it. The band, they're almost bands of tree limbs going up towards the top. They grow in a spiral sort of format. So you want to duplicate that in the larger shape that you're painting in. So I'm beginning to break those medium-sized shapes up into smaller shapes. And because I painted those underlying layers fairly thinly, this Next layer can go on a little thicker and I'm not going to pick up too much paint. Now what you can't see right there because it's off camera is that I am wiping my brush as much with the paper towels as I wipe my knife. So the real key to being able to paint a la prima, to paint all in one session, to paint thickly like that is to make sure you wipe your brush or your knife off. Otherwise, as you dip from one color to another, you're going to blend them and you'll end up with a soupy mess. It will all go gray. A certain amount of blending is fine. That's where you'll get more of your neutrals. But if you want to have some intense pure color on there, you're going to have to make sure that you're not polluting your color as you're applying it. Now I'm going in and breaking up that mass of grass and shadow on the right to bring it up to some of the same level of detail as the other areas. So one of the things to remember is not to go into uh, a pattern of working from left to right and going detail in one area and then moving to the next and doing all, all up to detailed level and then going on to the next. I am working from again general to specific so I'm developing the whole painting at once not one section at a time when you do that when you develop the whole thing at once there is more unity in the painting than if you deal with just one section at a time so now I'm going in and darkening up those shadows some because the foreground shadows are a little darker than the ones that are further away so I've added some of the dark lavender that I had mixed up earlier remember with the toric gray and the doxazine purple then developing the mass of the tree trunks on the left a little bit more One of the other things to remember, it besides working general to specific, background to foreground, is to think in terms of breaking those shapes up from dark to light. So the dark colors go down first and then the light. So here you see me taking that coral, the most coral pinky one that was on the left hand side in the row of three pinks. And I'm applying that to the trunks of the trees to indicate where the light was hitting. It won't go all the way from top to bottom because that's not how light strikes surfaces. The color changes, if you look closely, as you go from top to bottom. So look for those patterns of color. Remember to wipe the brush so that you keep some pure color. If it blends more than you want it to, you can always go back in and add some more pure color in. 
And also watch as I start to develop those tree limbs and twigs. You don't want to try to paint twigs from the get-go. If you do that, you're going to end up with a mass of little spider lines and no big strong shapes to pull the whole thing together. So I will not begin to flesh out tree limbs on those foreground trees um, until almost the end of the painting. So we have some warmth added to those trunks and they're beginning to have a little bit of a glow to them. They're still not as light as they're going to be in the end. Right now we've developed most of the painting up to kind of the middle value range. There are no real super lights in the foreground yet. We're going to get those in just a few minutes. And you see it, it was fairly easy and fairly quick to begin to lay in some of those thin tree trunks. Um, again, one of the things I want to emphasize, you don't want to put those in too early. It, you saw how little time it took to do those by applying the paint now. If I had tried to put them in first and then paint the sky around them, it would have taken twice as long. So by waiting to put the smaller shapes in until later, I'm able to establish those bigger shapes quicker and faster. So now I have the small shapes for those far distant trees. And in just a few minutes, we're going to get to the smaller shapes on the closer trees on the left-hand side. Because of where they are in space, those distant trees are catching the light just like the trees on the left. So just as with the trees on the left, I have loaded the brush with that coral pink and am putting it onto roughly the middle third of the tree trunks. Up underneath the mass of foliage on the pine tree, it's still going to be pretty dark. If you look back at the photo again, you can see that it's more of a dark purple right there. So I'm not going to take the pink all the way up. It only goes up to about the first third because of the angle of the light there. Make sure that you watch for that. I also want you to watch how the way I'm holding the brush changes depending on what I'm doing. I'm not holding it the same way all the time. You can hold it by the end and make very controlled small marks with it like I'm doing right now. Or you can hold it more like in your fist and make broader marks with it. Try some of both. Above all, you want to remember that you're not drawing with the pencil. The brush is not a pencil. So be sure not to hold it like a pencil and don't write with it. Now we've begun to really build up a sense of space here and a sense of light and illumination. And where you decide to stop on the development of your painting really is up to you. You can leave it with a certain level of abstraction or you can keep breaking down those larger shapes into smaller shapes to add more detail. That becomes completely up to you. So you decide in the end how abstract or how representational you want your painting to be by how much of the smaller shapes you choose to include in the painting. So here I'm developing those grasses a little bit more with some more intense color so that like the trunks of the trees, they indicate an amount of light that's hitting on them. They're not as intense, ever going to be as intense as that coral on the left hand side, but they're still going to have a degree of intensity. And here is the middle value of the lavender that I mixed. 
breaking up that dark purple sum. Notice that I'm not drawing blades of grass. So keep thinking big shapes into small shapes. Work back and forth between one side of the painting and the other. It's kind of like a dance. So here I've loaded the brush with some more coral and I'm going to develop that space on that bank a little bit more so it has some three-dimensional quality to it. So I'm using the shape of the brush stroke and the direction of the brush stroke to kind of inter, um, imply the terrain, the topography of that landscape. So angle it so that it begins to show that that is a little bit of a hill right there. It's low country, but it does have a little bit of a rise because again, like I said, that's an old road. And as it's been scraped through the years, it creates these a sort of sunken road between the banks of the side of the the fields and the woods on the side. Now I've taken some of the lightest of the pinks, yellowy pinks that I mixed, and I'm going back into the road looking at where the patterns of lights and darks intersect. And working in with the middle pink into the foreground. And in some ways, that middle pink becomes a warmer shadow color on the road. And it'll blend in as it's applied to the purple to create a mixture of the two together. The amount of pressure that you use on the brush will have some of the same effects as the knife. So watch how hard you bear down with it. If you push down, it will not only apply paint, it'll remove paint or mix paint. So be careful with how you hold the brush and how hard you push down on it. At this point, we're getting close to being finished. So the remaining touches are going to be to pull the light into the trunks of those foreground trees and the lights on the bank that the trees are coming up out of. Also going to put a few more lights onto that right hand side. One of the things that I like to do at this point in a painting is to stand back and take a good hard look. Look at what it needs. Paintings talk to you. So if you stand back, sit in a chair on the other side of the room, you're going to be able to tell what you need to do next because you're going to see it in a little bit different reference and frame than when you're right on top of it. So here I've gone into those tree trunks and added some of the lighter pink. So I'm beginning, beginning to bring those forward as well as those grasses on the right hand side. I have added some more of the sort of fiery coral color to the pine needles in those left hand trees and bringing a little bit of it into the distant background trees just to tone the green down a little bit. One of the things I noticed when I stood back was that that green was still too intense in that distant area of the painting. Since that it's not really super deep space because that's not that far away, but it is the furthest thing away in the painting. So it needed to be um, warmed up a little bit and lightened up a little bit. So again, you'll see those things more clearly if you stand back and look. It's just as important to look while you're painting as it is to actively paint. So I'm working between those distant trees and bringing that shape of the, the background trees a little bit more into resolution. At the same time, that also shapes the top of that mass of grass on the right-hand side. 
And one of the other things I realized was that I needed to look at the shadow space of that distant section of trees and make it a little bit more distinct. So I've actually taken a little bit more purple down into that shadow section. And working into the edge of those grasses. You can also go back in and refine the edges of shapes. Edges are very, very, very important. Super, super important. Um, edges give you clues to distance and to space and also add visual interest. So remember I said earlier that it is towards the end where you begin to add details. I have loaded that smaller brush with a dark color. It's the darker purple. And I am adding in branches from those tree to go to those trees. So I'm getting limbs and branches in the small ones. You don't need to paint every one of them, but you do want to break up the shapes some and kind of give a feel for what is there. The reason that I'm using the darks first is that filling in with the dark initially in those areas, those are the ones <clears throat> that are going to also have a highlight on them. So by putting down the dark first, then I can lay the light color in on top. So again, after every stroke, I'm wiping that brush to keep the paint from mixing too much. And bearing down a little harder so that as I stroke the dark color on, it pushes some of the other color away. And I'm going back into that tree trunk. And in that bottom third, I'm adding a color that is almost as intense as the coral that I put on the bank, that clay bank. Remember that color gets reflected all over the place. And one of the reasons that you see that color on the trunks is that light bounces up from the roadbed onto the trunks of the trees. So the reason they look pink Actually, some of it is because of the reflection of the pink in the clay from the road, but it's also because of the kind of light that we have at that time of year. The light is a very orangey, reddish light. So when it hits the trunks of the trees, it takes on that same orangey, red tone. See here we're going in and you see me break up those pine trees some more. Adding a few more details with that smaller brush. But notice that the smaller brush did not come out until the very end of the painting. We're in the final 10 or so minutes of painting. And the little brush didn't come out until then. Now I don't have five little brushes that I'm working with there. I'm working with one or two. And in between, hammering this home, in between, I'm wiping it off with paper towels. So I am wiping as much as I'm painting because that is the only way to keep from smearing paint everywhere. So we're down to the final strokes here. And those last touches of paint will be to the limbs and the trunks of the trees, making sure, double checking shadow masses and highlights. There I was darkening back in some of the distant limbs of the pine trees, making sure that the shadow to light contrasts are working. So constantly gauging back and forth between dark and light, dull and intense, and warm and cool. So what you see at play in this painting, through the whole painting, are ways to manipulate hue, value, intensity, and temperature to create the illusion of a strong sense of light.
It's all about light. So going up to that top of the tree to break up that mass a little bit more. Because the underside of the branches of the trees will catch, and the top part is going to catch the light. Going back in and adding a few more lights to the middle ground. And then making sure those tree trunks really have the feeling of warm sun hitting them. That there's a strong sense of reflected light cast up onto the trunks of those trees. If you need to, you can go back in and add additional values as necessary. So what you see I'm doing here is I'm going back into those trees and where there's too much dark showing or too sudden a jump from dark to light in the base of the tree trunks, I'm adding some more of that sort of middle toned lavender and breaking up and indicating some more distant thin trees in there as well. So continuously breaking up the larger shapes into smaller shapes. Again, you want to stand back, take a good long look. Pause, sit across the room. Here is the final painting, and you get that sense of winter, early fall, or late fall, early winter light striking the pines as the low angled sun hits them. So the title of this one is Winter Pines Back Road. Back roads are fun to paint because of those strong reflective qualities. And I hope that you have a little better understanding from this demo on how to play with using temperature and intensity to create that strong sense of light. Happy painting!